Hello? Hello? Hi there, Lou. Hello. Hi there, Lou. How are you? I'm fine. Thanks can for you agreeing. Hear me? Yes, I can. I can't. I can't, oh, yeah. I can't hear. <laughs> yeah, I can't hear you very well. Um, I'll, I'll try changing the network. Hold on. Yeah. That's better. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. I can hear you clearly. And I can hear you clearly. Okay, that's fantastic. Thanks for agreeing to come on. No problem. Um, yeah, we'll start in about uh, 10 minutes. Uh, okay. I'll call the other participants as well. So uh, is there anything that you would consider um, uh, off topic? Um, whatever, you've, whatever you've got ready for me. I'll okay, try my best to answer you. Just to let you yeah. know, yeah. Um, I'm speaking to you from from a homeless shelter that I that I run in Stoke on Trent. I've got 48 homeless people with me. Oh, that's we, fantastic! We yeah. look after them. So, just so you know, if you hear any noise in the background, it's because we've got 48 other people in here. No problem at all. Uh, is it possible for you to turn the video on? To I turn... can't see you. Oh, you, you can't see me. Hold on. Yeah. Hold on, I just get somebody in who's better at it than me. Okay. Hi, Ismail. Hi, Lou. You can't see me. Let's try to turn your video on. Hold on. Can't see me. What do we need to turn on? Is uh, The video. The video. Start video. Yeah. 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 Is that better? Yes. That, that's, yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. Hi. Okay, hi. <laughs> Hi, Lou, how are you? Hi, I'm fine, thank you. Yusuf, is it? Yes. Yes, Trad. yes that's my surname. Trad. How are you doing? All right, is it Trad or Isa, Isra? I've got Ismail, yes. I've got him okay. Yeah, you've got it good. So that's Trad. This is Hassan. Hassan, you've just you've just come on, Hassan. Yes, okay. I have now. Thank, thank you so much for being here. What a pleasure. What an honor. No problem. Wow. If I look too Lou excited, actually, I am. <laughs> uh, he's actually running a homeless shelter. Uh, I read about it as well on his profile, and he's there That's right. uh, currently with forty-eight other people right now. Ah, okay, so fantastic. That, yeah, that's it's a great a initiative from it as well. It's out in Stoke, is it not, Lou? Uh, the yeah, homeless shelter. Stoke, yeah. Yeah. yeah I, went, I, went, I went to uni in, in Staffordshire. So I used right. to come to Stoke once, once a week. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's a nice little town. It's okay. Oh. Yeah, it's, it's, it's all right. <clears throat> Been, okay, uh, so, uh, yeah. Um, uh, Lou, we're going to go live in about five minutes and the topics we're going to discuss uh, obviously your early days at Celtic 
and then uh, how your move to Man United transpired. I, re I read it on the website, and it was a great little story. So if you could just re repeat that when we go live, and okay. uh, obviously uh, you're also special because you deny Liverpool the treble, and we can safely say that we're the only team with the treble. Okay. <laughs> And obviously the current season, uh, Ole and uh, some signings as well. Okay, I'll just get someone else into the room, just in case something breaks down. Just hold on a second. No worries. No problem. Yeah, I've been stupidly dreaming at the screen this whole time. <laughs> <laughs> You're not the only one, bro. You're not the only one. You might be able to see in the background yeah. uh, some some donations we've had from Stoke City. Uh, and oh. the, the checks, big checks. You see them? 8,900, 10,000. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's probably a smile, son. <laughs> I don't know if you can see those. We can. I don't know if you can see them in the background. We, we can absolutely. That's that's quite amazing. That's quite fantastic. Yeah, it's it's a uh, it's a bit of a problem in the UK, especially these days. Homelessness. I think it's yeah. been on the rise. Yeah, it's been on the rise for some time. It's uh, really bad, especially. Um, well, it's bad across the country, but it's it's really bad uh, in, in a lot of parts of London as well, where I grew up. Yes, yes. And um, you know, there's just bad. yeah, nothing nothing's being done about it um, out there. At least it's such a great initiative that you're doing. Um, somehow, somehow in Pakistan, it I know it's there, but um, you're just a little bit more surprised when you see it in places like the UK. So, yeah. We were watching a video of yours today, Lou, the, 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 the aftermatch of the FA Cup final where you won. And um, the, oh, yes. the, the commentators asking you about uh, what's different from last time. And you said we scored more goals than they did. And I they're asking you. I didn't remember doing that. <laughs> I didn't remember. I didn't remember doing that interview. <laughs> Lou, what was all that about? Everybody was having, you know, a bottle of uh, milk with them and everybody was drinking. Was that a, a normal thing back then? At, at the FA Cup final back then and, and even years later, the main sponsor of the FA Cup was the milk people, milk marketing board. Uh -huh. So the milk people were the main sponsor. So after the game, whoever won stood there with a bottle of milk and they used to pay you, they used to pay the squad something like £1,000 between all of us, which was <laughs> a lot of money then. It so was. we used to get £1,000 from the milk people to sponsor it after the game. And then the, the, the bus that used to, when we went on the, the open top bus for the winning ceremony, that was had the milk all advertised all over the bus. So it was just one of the main advertisers of the FA Cup at the time. The FA Cup used to be fantastic. It was it was the biggest event of the year. It was the most watched event of the year. Um, and everybody around the world used to get ready to watch the English FA Cup final. But of course, since then, we've all devalued the competition and, it, and it's not the same anymore, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah I think there's just so much... Uh emphasis on the Premier League and the Champions League, you know, yeah. even though there's, like you said, there's so much history with the FA Cup and uh, uh, so much prestige. And yeah, it was it was yes. what everybody looked forward to for, for years. Okay, so Lou, we're live right now on Facebook. So first of all, thanks for being to come on. It's a huge honor to host you. Absolutely. As you can see, all of us are grinning with pride <laughs> because obviously you're a Man United legend. And... Uh, it's great to talk to you. Uh, so uh, we're going to start off first of all with uh, how you got here, transferred to Man United. Uh, well, I'd, I'd played for Celtic for about six years, um, and I was a Celtic supporter. I used to, I used to follow them as a boy. I used to travel to every game, home and away. But when I watched them, they were they weren't very good. Didn't win anything. 
didn't win any competitions. And uh, along came a manager who uh, I'm sure not many of you have heard a great deal about, called Jock Steen. And he came to Celtic and all of a sudden um, started winning everything. Won the European Cup, first British side to win the European Cup. He was the manager. Um, and, his, and his best friend later in life was our manager in Manchester United, our ex-manager, Sir Alex. Yeah. They were the best of friends mm -hmm. and they were identical to one another. Uh, you'll be aware of how Sir Alex managed at Manchester United. That was Jock Steen. He managed the exact same way and I'm sure Sir Alex learned from him. There was no messing around. There was, there was, the discipline was, it had to be a high standard of discipline. Um, no drink, no alcohol. It was all about working, training, uh, and winning cup competitions. Obviously, like Sir Alex said during his time at, uh, at Manchester United, a great manager. Um, but then I'd played for six years there, done okay, and asked to move on. Um, I, I waited probably about a month. It was, I didn't think there was any interest in me at all. And then all of a sudden, I got a call from the manager one night and told me to get ready the next morning. I was going to England. Didn't tell me where I was going because he wanted to keep it a secret. And um, next morning, the car came. I got in the back of the car with a driver. I asked the driver where we were going, and he said, I can't, I'm not allowed to tell you. Um, so we headed over the border in Scotland into England. And eventually, I ended up at Liverpool. I had no idea I was going to Liverpool. Uh, he hadn't told me. What I did know was Jock Steen and Bill Shankly, who was a manager at Liverpool time, were the best of friends. And they had decided about three weeks before I made this journey to Liverpool that um, that's where I was going. They decided it. I didn't. There was no agents at the time, nobody to hold your hand and, and talk you through your next move. So I was in his office. He offered me terms to sign. And then there's a game on versus they were playing Burnley in, in the FA Cup. Went upstairs into the director's bo box and watched the game. Um, the seat to my left was empty. It was the only seat in the director's box that was empty. And that was empty at kickoff. And right on kickoff, Pat Creran came in, who was a Manchester United assistant manager and who'd also played for Celtic. Sat down. He, he knew me because I was a Celtic player. Asked me what I was doing there, and I told him that I was I'd been brought in a car to sign for Liverpool. Um, he told me not to sign. Uh, he was going to speak to Tommy Doherty, who was United manager at the time, and he would tell me at half time that um, that the Old Trafford was my, was going to be my my destination. Uh, come back and said, right, we're going to sign you. Now I'm in Liverpool. I'm in the director's box, and I've just spoken to the Liverpool manager who. Bill Shankly himself was a, a very aggressive Scottish manager. Again, a bit like Sir Alex, stood no nonsense. Uh, and I was, I'd made up my mind I was going to Old Trafford. Best Lord Charlton were there at the time. Team wasn't doing very well. Liverpool were the best team in the country. And I thought the best place for me is going to be Manchester United. But I didn't know how I was, I was going to get the courage to go and tell Bill Shankly I wasn't signing. So I was shaking for the whole 90 minutes and I didn't enjoy the game but eventually I went downstairs at full time and told them that uh, I decided I didn't know Manchester United were interested in me but now I know they're interested I'm I'm heading up the road to, to Manchester and I'm, I'm going to sign for Manchester United in the morning and, and that's simply how it happened no no, you know, no long, no, no discussions for half an hour or half a day or two days or, or two months. Put pen to paper and, and a sign for Manchester United. Well, uh, that's a fantastic story. And first of all, obviously, with you being a Celtic player back in the day, congratulations because Celtic won their ninth title in a row today. Well, did yeah, they? they? Yeah, they did. <laughs> sort of won it. <laughs> this is the problem at the moment with the football. Everyone's winning yeah. things, but they're not playing. Um, so, so, so it's a bit crazy here at the moment. And I'm sure over there in Pakistan, you understand the, the situation because I know you, you follow Manchester United through thick and thin and, and you're all big Manchester United supporters. But it will be better when we actually start playing again. And I do believe after the German league played last 
Saturday. There is no reason for our Premier League not to start again. Uh, I've heard all the crazy stories and reasons how we, what we should do and where we should play the games. I've heard Australia mentioned. I've heard Malta yes. mentioned. There's, there's no need to play anywhere else except where we should have played, home and away. And that's what I believe will start to happen probably two or three weeks from now. Okay, uh, that's fantastic. Uh, Trad, you can go with your question. Okay, sorry, Trad, before, before you start, I'd just like to say that Lou said he did okay before he came to Manchester United. He scored 91 goals in those two years playing for the reserves in the first team. That's a lot of goals. That's much more than okay, Lou. <laughs> well, it was okay. <laughs> it was okay. There's a reason why Bill Shankly was so angry. Uh, Absolutely. That that. Absolutely. 91 yeah. goals. Uh, you can't shake a fan. Back when, back when defenders were allowed to do the kind of things I think Graham Sunes wants to do to Pogba all the time. You know? So, uh, yeah, that's an amazing that's record. All, that's all changed now. Yep. It's, it's, complete, it's completely different it's completely now. Different. You had to get through 90 minutes alive when you yeah. were a player back in the 70s. <laughs> Come off that pitch safe and sound, which yeah. thankfully we did most weeks. Uh, and the game itself, as we all know, was, was completely different. It was completely... You just, I just wanted to sign for Manchester United. I wanted to get on the pitch on the Saturday against West Ham, which I did do. I was playing against England captain Bobby Moore, which was a big occasion for me. Uh, and West Ham at the time were a good side. And that's, that's where I started. Scored a goal at Stretford End towards the end of the 90 minutes. Game ended up in 2-2. And I think most people were, were, were quite happy with my debut match. I was quite happy. And of course, then I went on to play 401 games. Loved every moment of it. I don't understand nowadays when when people are in discussions with Manchester United about signing for them, why it takes so long. Because, I know I'm biased, but it is the best club in the world. You're well looked after. Even after you leave, which, I've, you know, I left um, in, in 1984 as a player. Uh, I've been working for them ever since in, in one way or another, doing MUTV or, or doing the hospitality. So they don't forget you as well, which is another great thing. Because on a match day, I, I see all my old teammates. Um, I see a lot of them who are not as well as I would like them to be. But, you know, um, and it is a fantastic club. Uh, it's not because I played there, I'm saying that. It's because I've been there, I've witnessed it, I've done it. And I, I know without any doubt, it is a fantastic club to play for. Sorry, Trey. Right. Yeah. All right. Uh... We've seen in recent years, in the last two years or so, we've seen a lot of players turning into managers. Giggsy's managing Wales, Ole's managing United, Lampard's come in managing at Chelsea, uh, Gerrard's managing at Rangers. So you yourself transitioned into being a manager into the, in the second half of your career. So how was the transition from being a player to a manager? How did it change your perspective on football? And once you did transition into a manager, did you feel bad about giving your manager a bad time as a player? A particularly hard time you gave your manager as a player? What makes you think I gave any of my managers a hard time? <laughs> what makes you think that? <laughs> um, it's easy to be a player because it's in your hands. Uh, when you're a manager, you're relying on 11 people plus those people on the bench. So it's, it's a lot easier being a player. And I'm sure Ryan and all the, the ex-Manchester United people that have moved into management, I'm sure they would agree with that because a Saturday night after a game or and then the Sunday and then even the Monday, if you've lost and you've read the newspapers and, uh, you know, some not so nice things are said about you, you do get, um, you do get a little bit annoyed. But when you're a player, it's up to you. A lot of it's up to you to go and produce the goods, do what, you, what you're asked to do. Definitely being uh, a manager is a lot tougher than, than just being a player. You're finished every day. You, you start at 10 o'clock and you're finished every day of the week at 12. So you'd work two hours a day at the most and then you go home and you can relax. As a manager, especially in my time, when I went into management, you had to go and look for players all over England, you'd go out to games at night because you, even though you were the manager, you had to, you were in charge of 
finding the players as well. That's changed nowadays because every club has, you know, a chief scout and a number of of other scouts who go around England looking and, and really doing what the job of a manager used to be, recruitment of the players. Well, that's that's changed now. That's that's down to someone at the someone else at the club to to go out and spot the players, recruit them, do all the work, and really they're just presented at the club on on a, on a any particular day in front of the manager and they sign a piece of paper and become a Manchester United player. So, no, I'm in no, I'm in no doubt that um, that playing um, for for certainly for me, I would think Ryan, who you mentioned, it would be the same. I would think Frank Lampard, who uh, who did what he did in his career, and, and he had a fantastic career. And uh, the United lads that have gone into management, uh, I'm certain that most of them would agree that the playing time was the best time. Uh, okay, so uh, Lou, uh, about the FA Cup win in 1979, I think it was, which denied Liverpool the treble. Uh, were you, as players, aware of it, that uh, you were going to deny them? Or was it just uh, getting one over the rivals? We weren't aware because the next leg of their treble was on the Wednesday night after that game at Wembley. But I'm glad you mentioned the FA Cup because it used to be the greatest cup competition in the world. Uh, the preparation for it started when we left Manchester on a Tuesday, travelled to London, stayed in a hotel not that far from Wembley, and every day trained and prepared for what, uh, what was going to be the biggest football event in the world at the time. Um, filmed all over to most countries in the world, I wouldn't say everywhere, but filmed to most countries in the world, and it was the showpiece of, of English football. Now, where it's, where it's gone since those days to where it is now, with people even talking about, forget about the FA Cup, let's scrap it, there's too many games, and let's not have any, no replays. Um, I don't know how we've managed to go from, from that to where we are now. And, and I can honestly tell you, if you're fortunate enough to walk up the steps at Wembley, to collect a winner's medal, it's the greatest feeling you can ever have. Money can't buy that. There is, you can't buy that feeling of 100,000 people in a stadium. You've just won the FA Cup. You've just beaten Liverpool on top of that. Um, and then you got those steps. Uh, you got second when you win. I went up first the year before against Southampton because we lost. Didn't like that. Didn't want to do it again. And uh, with a little bit of luck, which you always need in the FA Cup, with a little bit of luck on the day with the winning goal, and no, I don't think anybody can deny that, uh, we lifted the trophy. Whereas 12 months earlier, uh, we weren't any, Southampton weren't any better than us. They just got a break near the end, like we did the year after when they, they got a goal that some people still say was offside. But they lifted the trophy, and um, I'm sure it's uh, probably the greatest achievement. Southampton's ever had and that's that told you the importance of the FA Cup um, where we are now and, and how much has been devalued and I've got to be honest the cup finals that United have been in recently when I've been there it's mm. it's just not the same it's yeah you're there it's an FA Cup final but there's something missing um, but that day we beat Liverpool there was nothing missing everything was everything was brilliant we won the game we eventually did stop them winning the treble and we picked up uh, an FA Cup winner's medal, which um, I was reminded of just before we come on, on air by, I think it was Hassan, reminded me about an interview I did after the game. And I didn't remember doing the interview because it's, what is it, how many years later? 50, or nearly 50 years later, or 40 yeah. something years later. So I didn't remember doing that interview, but it was all about what I had in my hand which was an FA Cup winner's medal. Um, and that feeling and, and having that in your possession was brilliant. Uh, okay, so uh, Hassan, do you want to go with your question or should I? Yes, uh, no, I'd like to ask Lou that you left um, and then Sir Alex came in about a couple of years later and obviously had a, you know, a very difficult start, <clears throat> something we, we all discussed the other. Did, obviously, with his success in Scotland with Aberdeen, you know, breaking in the old firm, 
uh, and doing very well. Did you, did you at the time, as someone who you know played in Scotland, played in England, knew Manchester United, knew the, did you think he had it in him when he came in? And with the start that he had, were you confident that he would be able to change it around? If you can get the better of Celtic and Rangers in Scotland, and you're the manager of any other club, you've got something about you. You've got some magic that can do something because Celtic and Rangers rule in Scotland. They are, they are the, the two biggest clubs, the two biggest teams. They've got the most money in Scotland, that is. So I knew all about, uh, I knew all about Alex, it was at the time, Alex Ferguson, but um, I was a little bit surprised how he didn't get off to a good start. But what he's ended up with, that record he's ended up with, it, it doesn't surprise me. The record will never be broken. He is, in my opinion, uh, the greatest ever Scottish manager. Uh, he's the greatest Manchester United manager. Unless someone does come along and betters his record, which I am confident no one's going to do it. And everything about him when he came reminded me of, of Jock Steen, the way he trained, the way he used to shout at people, the way he used to conduct uh, a half-time um, with, the, with the players. You know, we've heard of all the, the famous things about the boots flying across the dressing room and all that and, and disagreeing with players. That was my first ever manager, Jock Steen. Sir Alex was, was a replica of him. Um, I was terrified of Jock Steen. I was terrified of Sir Alex when he came to Old Trafford. I'm probably still terrified of him to this day. Um, and I don't know why I call him Sir Alex because I never played under him. Um, but it's, um, and I call him boss as well. I don't understand that because I say I didn't play under him. Um, the Sir Alex, obviously, because he's Sir Alex, but a lot of other people call him Alex, but I can't get around to calling him that because what he did at Manchester United um, was just incredible. We, we went through, not only with, with the results, the players he produced or helped to produce. Again, it was like seeing he helped produce myself, who I don't think I'd have been a player if it hadn't been for, if it hadn't been for his guidance. Um, there was Kenny Dalgleish started with me at uh, Celtic as well. And I speak to Kenny quite often, and he says the same. If I hadn't been from a manager, we probably wouldn't have been the players that we turned out to be. We wouldn't have played so many games uh, because he was a fitness fanatic, wanted you super fit. So we all um, we all owe, we all owe, owe our careers to our respective manager at the time, which in my case was Jock Steen. And in the case of the United lads, the um, the lads class of 92, they had they had him as their boss and he guided them through um, he guided them through their careers. And we'll never ever, I don't think we'll ever have a bunch of players, so many as good as them at the time. Again, that's what he managed to do. I don't I haven't seen it since so many coming through, getting in the first team, staying in there for a number of years and going on to win the trophies that they did. So uh, he eventually, Sir Alex eventually achieved at United what what probably no better than better than I expected him to do, far better than I expected him to do. Okay, so uh, Lou, I'm reading comments right now on our Facebook page. Uh, everybody's thanking you for coming on and everybody's also uh, thanking you for um, making your fish and chips job <laughs> because everybody <laughs> had that <laughs> and they love it. <laughs> yeah, well, I bought that just to give you a, a little bit, bit of a story about the fish and chip shop. Yeah. I didn't sort of decide one day I was going to have a fish and chip shop. I uh, left Old Trafford one day, went up to the top of the road where the fish and chip shop was, and I looked across the road and I saw a number of shops. But one of them was was dark, and it was obviously there was no one in it. Knocked at the door, and an elderly woman came out, and I asked her why the shop was in darkness, and she said because she's had enough and she wants to sell it. So I said, well, I'll buy it off you. So I bought it off her there and then. Um, I was on my way to the World Cup uh, that month in Argentina in 1978, and I went to the World Cup with a fish and chip shop. No idea what I was going to do with it when I come back, whether I was going to change it. It was a, it sold, um, I forget what it sold at the time, but when I come back, I decided fish and chip shop at the top of the road. So that's 1978, and um, we're still there. Yeah, and going strong. 
when you come over from Pakistan, I guarantee you, you free fish and chips for you. I'm if you tell them I'm a manager, yeah, as long as you've not got a big supporters club, you've not got 50 <laughs> or 60. I think we're 100 plus. I think now you're giving everyone an incentive. No, no was, come for the same game. <laughs> I, I remember my first game at Old Trafford, it was the first thing I did was went and get the fish and chips before the game because I asked one of the locals, what's the thing to do? And he said, you got to go to lose, you know, and, and get the fish and chips. And I said, okay. And I did that every time. I've been to Old Trafford, I think, five times. Every single time I've, I've gone, got my chips before the game, got my fish and chips, and gone watch the game. It's a ritual for the, for the match support. Uh, for the fans that go, it's, it's, it's a part of our history now, isn't it? It is. It, well, it's a part of mine because obviously I own it and I want the team to be successful because the most successful they are, the most successful everyone connected with Manchester United is. And over the last few years, it's been, from time to time, it's been a little bit disappointing. But uh, we're all hoping, I'm sure, and I say this, I hope I'm saying this on, on behalf of the majority of Manchester United supporters, we'd all like to see all these succeed. Absolutely. Then it's trophies again. Um, a bit like Sir Alex, he's got off to a little bit of a slow start. Things just started to be, seem to be picking up when we were hit with the virus. And um, when we come back from this virus and start playing again, um, I'm hoping by, by the end of the season, that uh, we've achieved something, either top four or, or Europa League. But uh, th things seem to be improving um, as time goes on. Let's hope that continues. Hopefully. Okay, so Tarad, you can go. Uh, Lou, uh, you started out as a striker and then you later on went on to be a midfielder in your career. How did that transition uh, happen? And did that in part increase the longevity of your career? And how was the transition overall for you? Um, well, it was a transition that um, happened at Manchester United because at Celtic I was given a role of, I was a centre forward, but I was given a role of the manager's instructions were the same every week. Just run, run and keep running and run till you drop. That was his instructions because he wasn't a big tactical manager, Jock Steen. He just wanted to see players playing to their strength and he felt my strength was my ability to, to, to run for that 90 minutes. So when I came to Manchester United, Tommy Doherty was well aware of that I had played in midfield because I'd played there for Scotland when he was the manager. And um, we decided I'd drop back into a midfield role. Stamina was no problem to me. I could run. But then back in, in those days, most players in, in, in most teams all had quite incredible levels of fitness. You know, they could all run. They were all, because as a kid, you all you did was kick a ball around till it got dark up in Scotland. You kicked it, you know, playing with other boys out in the streets. And it wasn't until your mum and dad shouted you in at night, did you go in? So that ball skill that um, most Scottish youngsters had, and they probably still got that to this day, um, was always with you. So you, when I went to England, I had that, um, had the ability to play in midfield. And, and also the stamina to play there as well. I enjoyed every minute of it because you were in the thick of the action and the, the great players that I played against. Um, um, somebody mentioned Sunes earlier. Now, Graham Sunes would probably get sent off every week nowadays because his <laughs> game was about strength, power. And when he tackled you, you realised he tackled you. Um, and there was lots of players like that in, in, the, in the league at the time. There was also some fantastic players. Alan Ball, who played for England. If you thought you were fit and you could run for 90 minutes, you maybe thought different when you played against Alan Ball because he could, he was like a little machine that you, you turned the candle and he went away and started playing and he kept going for 90 minutes. Stamina was unbelievable. Ability was unbelievable. And um, it was no surprise that with with him and a number of other players at the time, uh, Bobby Moore, centre-half, who, who I played against on my debut for West Ham, um, captain of England. No surprise at the time that England won a World Cup because there were that many players that were capable and good enough of achieving that. And on the day at, um, at Wembley, they managed to do it. But um, all my career and, and everything that was attached to it, and I would say, I'm speaking for Kenny Dalglish as well, 
we all looked back and thanked our manager at the time, who, who was Jockstein. We, we wouldn't have achieved what we managed to achieve without his influence. His influence was, was vital. Uh, okay, so uh, Lou, there are some fan questions. Uh, Normanza here and Shiraz have asked that you played with the Holy Trinity. And uh, who was the best player among them? And how was it like playing with best? Um, well, there were three exceptional players, obviously. Um, what they'd done in their career was, was incredible. Um, I've got to say, so Bobby, because of his age, I looked up at him and I thought, this is this is an incredible athlete. This is an incredible footballer. Uh, he was first out to training every morning. He was last in. He was in his 30s, well into his 30s. I think maybe 34 or 35 at that time. Uh, football crazy. Discussed football all the time. Talked about it. Helped all the, the younger players that were coming to Old Trafford. Obviously myself included. Wasn't concerned about you were a possible threat to his position because I think he I think he accepted that the younger players were, were on their way to Manchester and that his time was possibly up, but it wasn't up because of his lack of ability. It was up because of a 35, 36 nature takes its course and and you become sometimes excess to requirements. Um, but a wonderful man, Dennis Law. I started with Dennis when I was with the Scotland team. He was the number one centre forward and I played just behind him or up front with him at the time. <coughs> and um, Taught me many things about playing centre forward. About and The main thing he taught me, you've got to be tough. He says, don't let these central defenders or centre halves, as we called them at the time, don't let them bully about. You get the first blow in. And Dennis used to get the first blow in sometimes because you would see a centre half lying on the floor in agony, and Dennis had just tackled them. So that was a wonderful education from, from Dennis. But then I've got to say the, the, the cream of the crop, and I'm sure Dennis and, and Sir Bob would, would agree, was, was George. Um, for a lot of people who are just reading about George from those days, will probably have the impression that George was a footballer walking about uh, and drinking all the time, and taking advantage of um, every spare minute he had, spending in nightclubs and that. That wasn't George when he was playing. That was George very late on in his career, where I think he, he seen everything fall apart. He's seen his days at Manchester United coming to an end. And I think when that happened, and I think because it was Manchester United, and George had joined as a young boy from Belfast, loved the club, Love playing for Samar, love playing for Manchester United. I think it was then when he seen his Manchester United career falling apart um, that he lost the plot in and things went horribly wrong from towards the end. You know, it's crazy to think that, in my opinion, the best player that probably we've ever seen at Old Trafford ended up playing in non league football. He ended up playing in America. He ended up playing for Tampa Bay Rowdies and and one or two Fort Lauderdale. Now this this was anyway, this was the the greatest player Manchester United have ever seen probably. Now playing in America, and I think that how highlights how bad it went for George at the end. And of course, playing at a packed Old Trafford every week isn't the same as playing in America for Tampa Bay Rowdies. It's it's completely different. So uh, before my very eyes, I saw probably the, one of maybe three of the greatest players I'd ever seen or ever played with sort of just disappear in front of my eyes. He just all of a sudden was out of the game and no longer no longer playing. And that's when the, the alcohol took its part. He then lost the plot a little bit and the alcohol came into play. But as a professional, and I would think that everybody who played Old Trafford a lot longer with him than I did. I would think all those lads, if you ever speak to them, will tell you he was an ideal professional. Superb athlete, um, as fit as anybody in the team. Unfortunately, the younger generation who are, are now having to read about George Best will just read about um, later on in his football career when it went wrong for him. But make no mistake, this, this was a genius. 
this was a genius. You're not seeing any geniuses play nowadays. You're seeing a lot of good players, but we're not seeing a genius like George Best. That's absolutely right. Uh, uh, Bilal Ahmed has also asked a question uh, that what are your thoughts on the current squad? Uh, is there any potential to win something or do we need additions uh, urgently for the first team? Normally when a season's over, let's say this, uh, this time it normally would be getting to an end. I don't normally think that you need much um, movement at Manchester United in or out. I normally take the view, yeah, I think we've got enough. I don't take that view this time. I don't take, I think we do need players in. I think we need one or two players that are going to push us, hopefully, um, let's say Champions League, push us in the Champions League. Champions League requires a squad of good players, exceptionally good players. Uh, I'm not saying the squad we've got now are not good enough. They may surprise me, but I, I think what would help them is one or two names coming in, one or two faces coming in that we all we all know who they are, we all know what they've done at uh, somewhere else, because one or two may leave. Um, Paul Pogba may leave. There's talk again this week in the papers about, you know, Paul thinking about Juventus and Real Madrid, or Real Madrid and Juventus thinking about Paul. If that does happen, that, uh, that brings an end to that saga, which has been going on for quite a while now. Um, and we, we, we do need people to come in that we think that can improve the squad. At least I think we, we need people to come in that can improve the squad. And I probably think Ollie, Ollie probably feels the same way as well. Any manager would. If you can get your hands on the best players that are around, and let's be honest, Liverpool have walked away with the title, even though officially it's not over. But they've walked away with the title and because at this moment in time they've got the best players. So we need to spend some money. There is money to spend. I know that for a fact. And we need to go out there and, and bring in one or two people to just give everyone, give everyone, not just the team itself, but management staff at Carrington and above all the supporters to give them a big lift to show them that um, that we need we, we mean business and we're, we're trying to bring in a team that's... Um, capable of delivering the biggest trophies. Absolutely. Uh, okay, so uh, Lud, uh, there have been some influential figures in United's history. Brian Robson comes to mind, Cantona comes to mind. I mean, you mentioned the class of 92, but Cantona was integral in mentoring them and uh, helping them reach the level that they reached later on. Uh, currently in this squad, uh, do you see any uh, such leader or someone who comes close to that I mean, Bruno Fernandes is highly talked of. Uh, Harry Maguire has been uh, tremendous as a captain. So uh, do you see uh, many leaders in our squad right now? I don't know about leaders. I don't know them well enough, but uh, I know I was fortunate enough to play with, in, in my 11 years at Old Trafford, I was fortunate enough to play with lots of born leaders. But I must say, every time, every time we, we went out to Old Trafford, the 11 people that went down that tunnel, we were all leaders. We'd be arguing in the dressing room before the game. We'd be arguing at half time. The manager wouldn't have to jump in and say anything. The game has changed greatly since then, where there's not so many people who, um, you know, Martin Buckham was my captain. Martin carried the ball out, tossed the coin, uh, instructed everybody during the game what he thought. But we all, we could all be part of that captaincy. And we all were. Um, Brian Robson, who I played with Brian when he came to the club. Um, great captain, great player. Uh, we didn't call him Captain Marvel for any other reason, except he was Captain Marvel. A quite incredible athlete of a player. Um, late on in his career, picked up one or two injuries, but right throughout his career, uh, there was no one better getting from midfield into the opposition penalty box at pace, with strength, with power, knocking people over, uh, so he could do that. And I don't see many of those players around nowadays. So I don't really expect to see those players. And I think Bruno, who you've mentioned, I think it's fair to say he's a completely different player to Brian Robson. He's a he's a footballing midfield player. 
he can get forward, he can get into the box, likes to shoot, which um, is a good thing because we didn't have many that many players last season like to have a shot from any distance, from any angle. Everyone was a bit cautious, too many passes. So high hopes for Bruno, but uh, I'm not expecting anybody exceptional to come to be arriving and be a leader. They're just going to be part. It seems to be part of a squad game nowadays, where where they go out there and they do their own thing, and and then they're quite happy to come in and just accept what's happened in that 90 minutes. The game's changed, and and the captaincy role has changed a great deal as well. All right, uh, Hassan, uh, do you have any question? Yes, actually, I wanted to ask Lou something uh, <clears throat> quite relevant to our history that you would also be able to explain to us. United have always had a strong British core, you know, with Dennis Law and yourself, and then later on with uh, Chucky McClare, obviously Roy Keane and Dennis Irvin, you know, coming over from, from Ireland, Ryan Giggs from Wales, um, Georgie Best from Northern Ireland. We're seeing a little bit of it now with Scott McTominay and Dan James. Being, you know, Scott being a regular starter when he's fed, Dan James coming in, um, obviously the English lads or the local lads. It's something that's been missing there for some time though, hasn't it? Before this year or these last couple of years, we've not had the same level of um, British players coming in. And I'm seeing it over at Liverpool with, with Robertson and, and they seem to be scouting or other clubs seem to be scouting. Are we not scouting it the same way or are we just, uh, our system is uh, not picking them up? No, you've, you've mentioned the, the ones that are prominent in the, in the Premier League. <clears throat> but I think it's fair to say, if you go to, if you go up to Scotland, even the, the most ardent Celtic supporter or Rangers supporter um, won't be... I don't think they'll be telling you they've got that many real top-class young players especially. I don't think that'll be what they'll be telling you. I think they'll be telling you, you know, they need as many of the, those players to stay in Scotland as possible because, the, you know, the Scottish national team, and I'm sure you follow the results of most national teams, was also the Scottish national team are pretty poor. Um, Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, where we used to have so many players, we used to get that many players from both those countries, Wales and as well. And at, at the summer, which we're approaching soon, we used to have... Um, probably 30 or 40 British players came to the cliff at the time, which is a, the old training ground, and were on trial. Uh, a lot of them made it, a lot of them didn't, but there was plenty, there was plenty on trial. And since then, I've spoken to one or two of the people in the youth set up, and their view is they just can't find those, those younger players in the same numbers as they used to. Scott McTominay's come in, it was fantastic to to find him to start with, came in, um, livened the team up at the time, I thought. It was str he's strong enough to play, so there's, there's no doubts about his strength and power. And then one or two others come in, Dan James come in, first few games he was brilliant, and then it probably caught up with him a little bit, um, because then people could see how quick he was and he'd be more tightly marked. But there is a couple of players that I'm sure that uh, Ollie will be looking at in Scotland, but certainly not the numbers they had in my day. I mentioned going to the World Cup in Argentina, um, and after we beat Wales in the qualifier, uh, we played at Anfield, after we beat them, the Scotland squad was announced, the first number of Scottish players that they were going to pick the Scotland squad for, for the World Cup in Argentina was announced, and there was 80 of us, there was 80, Scottish players that, that Ali McLeod, who was a manager, was going to pick from. He then narrowed the squad down to 40. And even though I'd played in every game, including the game we beat Wales, and I was I was in the 40, I still wasn't confident I was going to make that World Cup. Only when it was announced one Tuesday afternoon uh, did I realise I was, I was going to Argentina and I was going to be there as a Scotland player. Before that, when I looked at the squad and I saw Souness... Asa Hartford, um, Willie Johnston, great, um, um, one or two others, and Archie Gemmell in midfield as well. Don Masson, who was a, a QPR player at the time. Bruce Reuk. All those, were they, they were just part of the midfield setup. When I looked at their names, I thought, Kenny Dalglish, obviously, I'm going to miss out here. 
but fortunately I got there. Um, but you're right, there was there was hundreds and hundreds of Scottish players desperate to play football in Scotland. And then if they were good enough, moved, moved on into England. Uh, okay, so uh, Lou, we've, we've had several managers since Sir Alex retired. And uh, obviously, uh, David Moyes was brought in and he was sacked. Uh, Van Gaal was brought in. Mourinho was brought in. Uh, do you think they were given enough time uh, individually as managers? Um, it was mission impossible for them. I said, I said whoever was going to follow Sir Alex, I said it on MUTV one night, I said whoever was going to follow, follow Sir Alex, he's going to fail because what Sir Alex did, I still say it, won't be equaled again. It was, he was a win machine. He could get those players winning games that, that we weren't entitled to win. Um, we saw that time and time again, how somehow or other he, he'd do something uh, that, that got the winning goal or helped contribute to get the winning goal. That was the genius in the man. So whoever followed after that, and I know David Moyes well. I said to him at the time when he arrived, I said, you've taken on Mission Impossible. And whatever he'd done, he was never going to match the previous manager. And then Van Gaal came, and, and again, it was it was going to be tough for him um, because you had to live up to a standard that a, the greatest manager of Manchester United had, had achieved, which was that standard of simply winning most of your Premier League games, doing well in Europe and, and winning in Europe. Um, the man was a genius, so I just think, give those managers that I've talked about, give them that time again to think about are they going to follow Sir Alex? They'd probably think twice about it if they had the chance to do it again and not follow him and, and come in maybe as Ollie's come in now, well down the line, years later, when he's still got a mountain to climb, obviously to, to match what Sir Alex has done and he, he's never going to achieve that. And that's not been disrespectful to Ollie. But um, that's the target you, you had as soon as Sir Alex left. That was a target you had in, in people's minds, supporters' minds, that the next fella should come in and more or less do what, what he had done. That uh, that was never going to happen. By the way, guys, uh, Louis is with us right now. He's in a homeless shelter that he runs, and he's with 48 people right now. And obviously, uh, a person as great as him will do that. And if you want to help in any way, you can get in touch with me, and I'll, I'll talk to Louis as well. So, uh, if you want to get in touch, then uh, we'd love to help as well. Uh, so, uh, yeah, has anyone? To we, we, we do get. A, yes. Let me just say, we do get a lot of support. Uh, we get a lot of support from from people in Stoke, and behind me is a number of checks on the wall. The Stoke City have presented to us for various events we've done. We get a lot of support from Old Trafford. Um, I've got forty eight homeless people, and. Um, Whenever we get any trainers or tracksuits from Manchester United, this place goes crazy. <laughs> I lose control of them all. They go crazy for for whatever it is, whatever, whoever's trainers it is. And if I say that whoever's trainers, the place goes crazy. And we've had a great support from from um, from Manchester United. Johnny Evans, who's now at Leicester, Helen who I work with on MUTV. She's come here with Johnny three or four times, bringing us four or five bags of, of football stuff because they love the, the football stuff. Johnny's football stuff is stuff he wore at Old Trafford, Manchester United stuff. So that, they go crazy for that. Uh, I did a, a podcast with Wes Brown last week or the week before, I think it was, and Wes is going to bring in some trainers and tracksuits. Um... So we get we get well looked after and, and well supported from everybody at Old Trafford. I know from experience that there's a there's a large Pakistani community out in Stoke. I used to come there for every weekend, you know, looking for food and things like that. So I think what we'll do, Ismail, we'll get in touch with them and let them know. And I know they'd be willing to help. It's Ramadan, you know, there's it's a time a lot of people want to do and with what's going on in the world. So it's such a great initiative. That if any of us can help be a part of it in any way, I think it would be a great honour for all of us. That would be brilliant. Every so often, um, the Pakistani community does come here with pots of different curry. Again, yeah. much 
there's as much liking for the curry as there is for the Manchester United stuff. They love the curry. Yeah, that's comes, what we're going to tell them to do. Yeah, anybody wants to bring a pot of curry, it'll be gone, gone in Brilliant. twenty minutes. That's that's the way it should be. That's the way we 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 don't like our, we don't like taking time to eat Pakistanis. We like putting it there and just you know, woof, gone. So it'll be gone. It'll be woof. And it'll be gone. <laughs> brilliant. brilliant, brilliant, just like us. I've got to thank you for getting in touch with me. First time I've, I've done anything in Pakistan, and I'd just like to thank Pakistan and, and all the the Manchester United supporters that are there. Lou, if you if you knew the excitement today, it was it was like we woke up Christmas morning. You know, I was calling my brother, and he was like, "What? Are you serious?" I was like, "Yes, I'm going to talk to Lou." He's like, "I remember watching Lou." on MUTV all the time. And I was like, well, yeah. And you know, we've, uh, Trad was in the office, getting ready, coming home, Ismail who runs the thing. And we've got all the kids. We're, we're so honored and excited for us. It's such a big thing because we love United. Uh, and I think for some years ago, I remember talking to someone and they said, do you even have football in Pakistan? And we've got hundreds, hundreds of official paid up fans. We're all official members. Um, when, when, when my son was born, the first thing Ismail did was make him an official member. And it's the same for, for his son. <laughs> it's, in our, it's in our blood, you know. We, I've been to Old Trafford, Ismail's been to Old Trafford. We followed the games. I can't remember the last time I missed a game on the telly. I've, I followed games on, on the radio all over. So for us to have a bona fide legend, it's, it's such an amazing, amazing feeling. Thank you so much. We, we no, really thank you. I, I've, I've been Thanks. asked in the last two or three days by the club to ring a number of supporters and I've rang them, obviously they didn't know I was going to ring and the response we've had has been fantastic and, and when I asked them about Manchester United um, all of them say we live for Manchester United and that is, you know, to hear people around the world talking about living for, for Manchester United is quite incredible. So once again, just like to thank you all and uh, don't hesitate to, to ask me to come on again. Now I know how to work this Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> work it now. Couldn't work it before. You're an no, expert. That's already. fantastic. It's a huge honor for us. And obviously, Hassan Tarad and myself are hugely pleased that you agreed to come on and oh. so are our fans. And obviously, we'd love to bring you on again. And we also try to get in touch with Wes Brown as well. He hasn't replied yet, but hopefully he will soon. Because I'll he's get, another legend we'd love to, to talk Wes. to. The first game at Old Trafford, I'll speak to Wes. I'll be with him because I work there and on the match day for MUTV. And I do the hospitality with the sponsors. And Wes will be there somewhere. I'll find him. And and I'll, and I, I know I speak on behalf of all of us, Lou. When things are better, hopefully, and this virus is gone and... People are traveling again. You know, you always have a home in Pakistan. Just come on down. We've got great food. Um, you know, we've got good people, lots to see. It would be an absolute pleasure to, to have you here. Brilliant. I appreciate that. Appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you Lou. Th thanks Thank for your you, time. Lou. Thank has you so been much, Lou. Have a great day. Have a great day. Thank, Thank you so you. much for this. Thank you. Take care. Bye. -bye.